Welcome. Welcome to the longtime friends of the Sackler Center, and welcome new friends of the Sackler Center, and welcome everybody to the Brooklyn Museum on this Sunday, December 14th, 2014. And this is our final Sackler Center public program for the year. And we have a lot coming up next year, but this is a wonderful way to end all of the wonderful and exciting and important programming that we do throughout the year. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Sackler. I am AKA at uh, Sackler Soapbox, if you're a tweeter. And today, if you want to tweet, you can do hashtag Emma Sulkowitz and hashtag States of Denial. And I always join you to join, uh, invite you to join us at Feminist Art, which is the name of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art uh, Twitter site. So there is beauty in our imperfect imperf union, our imperfect union called the United States of America. The beauty that we can and sometimes we do take to the streets when the union is cracked and crumbling, when the union leaves our constitution and our bill of rights in the dust, we take to the streets to protest or in civil disobedience. Citizens have finally, and yes, even some of our politicians have finally, after 15 years, due to perhaps sleep deprivation from overwork, or stimulation from virtual living, or as a result of paramilitary training of police forces and propaganda producing fear and loathing. But yes, citizens have finally emerged from a comatose state and realize a parade permit is not required to protest. And that makes me so happy. <laughs> It is our democracy, it is our right, it is our constitution, and we are in the streets again, bravissimo. There is also, there is also a beauty to our imperfect museum. As all museums like life, we are imperfect by definition, but our beauty is that we get better all the time. We are about and are the power of art and the beauty of culture. The Brooklyn Museum teaches the beauty of our history and our history, and the beauty of immersing ourselves in the present with your presence. Dedicated to the education of our visitors as well as our large community, we bring all manners of relevance to you, manners of relevance that are the underpinnings of a civil society. We offer solace with art during painful times and the power of art during times of change. When Americans are enraged, revolutionary change is in the offing. People have taken to the streets with a clear message. Police violence, violence against women, all violence as a cultural norm, public, and private must end. Protest is, in fact, sweeping the country and, in fact, going across the waters. The September 22nd, October 3rd New York Magazine's cover had a photograph of Emma Sulkowitz, a visual arts major at uh, Columbia University, with her blue mattress leaning supported on her back. And the block letters on the cover announced a very different kind of sexual revolution on campus. For those of you who are of my generation, we know what kind of sexual revolution we enjoyed on campus. <laughs> Vanessa Gregoriodis wrote in her New York article, by owning accusations, by pointing a finger not only at assailants, but also at the American University, the ivory tower of privilege, those survivors of rape, have built the most effective organized anti-rape movement since the late 70s. Rape activists 
now don't talk much about women's self-care and protection like they did in the 90s, or take back the night marches, which many of us do remember, self-defense classes, and cans of mace. Today, the militant cry is aimed at the university. Kick the bastards out. End of quote. <laughs> Vanessa said that Sulkowitz's generation retired the word victim, preferring survivor. But, she writes, and I quote, Sulkowitz calls carrying the mattress performance art. And that is why we're here today, and that is why Roberta Smith is here today with us to be in conversation with Emma. Carry That Weight, the title of Emma's piece, was named number one of the, be of the 19 best art shows of 2014 by Jerry Saltz and Vulture, the New York, uh, New York Magazine Online. And from Jerry's paragraph, I took snippets. Art is born of many things, among them righteous indignation, messianic rage, and the drive for, for justice. Emma Sulkowitz's powerful performance piece, Carry That Weight, comes from all these places and from great activist art as well. Since September, she's simply carried around campus alone or with the offered help of others a 50-pound mattress identical to the one on which she was raped. He ends, this work is pure, radical vulnerability. I had the pleasure of meeting Emma a, f a few weeks ago and discussing her work, her experience uh, as a performance artist, uh, her protest, and of course her art. It is my job here at the Brooklyn Museum and it is my calling and my passion in life to weave the threads of art, culture, community, justice, and righteousness together. That is the job of all good citizens and all great institutions, and I thank all of you for joining me here to do that today. Biographies. Emma Sulkowitz was born and raised in Manhattan, New York. She is a senior at Columbia University, majoring in visual arts. After the university failed to expel the student who raped her and has assaulted a number of other students, Sulkowitz has become an outspoken activist on campus. Last fall, she collaborated with Zoe um, Ridolfi Starr and others to found No Red Tape. Recently, for her senior thesis, Arts Project, Sulkowitz has begun an endurance performance art piece titled Mattress Performance, Carry That Weight, in which she is carrying a dorm room, extra large, twin-sized mattress everywhere she goes on campus for as long as she attends the same school as her rapist. Mattress performance has sparked a national movement, and students all over the country have shown their support by protesting with mattresses of their own. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Robert Smith to the Sackler Center at the Brooklyn Museum to converse with Emma. Roberta Smith was born in New York City. Uh, we're all native New Yorkers, isn't it lovely? In 1947, raised in Lawrence, Kansas, and graduated from Grinnell College in Grinnell, Iowa in 1969. She has written art criticism for the New York Times since October 1986. She was art critic for the Village Voice from 1981 to 1985, and in the 1970s wrote for Art Forum, Art in America, and Arts Magazine. She worked on the Donald Judd catalog resume and has contributed essays to museum catalogs on various artists, including Judd, Alex Katz, Elizabeth Murray, and Cy Twombly. Smith has lectured widely and taught at the, at the School of Visual Arts in New York and the Rhode Island School of Design. She received art criticism grants from the NEA in 1975 and 1980, and in 2003, she received the Frank Jewett Mather Award for art criticism from the College Art Association. Smith lives in New York City with her husband, Jerry Saltz, who I quoted earlier, senior art critic for New York Magazine. Please join me in welcoming these two wonderful women, Emma Sulkowitz and Roberta Smith. Thank you.
thank you all for being here today. It's really, we're really thrilled, and now we'd just like to go home. <laughs> um, Emma and I really haven't spoken since my article came out, so we've got a lot of catching up to do. And I thought we would just, if, if she and I were getting together for a coffee, I would have tons of questions. And I thought we would we'd talk about that. And also, maybe how we came together. Like, my, I wrote on her because it was suggested by an editor, although I certainly knew about it. And um, as I told Emma, and she then told me today that I had told her when I met her that <laughs> I, don't, I don't usually talk to students, art students. I feel like, just let them wait to get into the art world. And I don't, I don't do studio visits anymore, because if I go to one studio, I'd really have to go to everybody's studio. So it was, a very, it was very unusual for me to be doing that. It made me nervous when she said that. <laughs> <laughs> and in point of fact, it took me about three tries to find the building, right? You were sort of like talking me in. <laughs> um, so my first question would be, to Emma would be, do you have gloves? Gloves? Gloves. Have you gotten them yet? <laughs> um, well, I have a suspicion that one of my sweet mates is going to give me some for Secret Santa. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, I've, I keep meaning to go, but then I forget. And I don't know, he said something about industrial strength gloves, and I know Secret Santa's coming up, and I feel like he might as I might as well let him make the purchase. Every time it rains, I get kind of very far in maternal instincts, wondering what's going on with Emma, and <laughs> how is she managing, and, you know, even when I was first met her, when we were doing this, I was like, oh my God, what's your mother going through? Like, the ice, the snow, you know, it's like the mail getting through, M-A-I-L, and um, <laughs> I just... I couldn't, and then we had this weird thing where there was, we started talking, and then the New York Times' Jennifer Edelman came in. The photographer. And no. started photographing, and so she was like moving me out of the way, and you know, this room that you've probably seen photographs of where Emma has the rules of engagement, this fabulous kind of environmental thing. And she so, would ask questions like, um, so how long are you going to be carrying it for? And I'd be like, um, it's. It's on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was coming to do her job, and she sort of plunged in. Yeah. And then we had this, I don't know how it was for you, but it was totally bizarre because I had wanted to see Emma carry this, actually see it in action. So, and of course the photographer did too. And so we set out from, what's, what it's called? the Wa Watson Hall. Watson Hall which is like 115th? 115th and Broadway, basically. Yeah, west of Broadway, so then we had to go up to the campus, and her dorm is on the far side. So there was this kind of cavalcade of <laughs> Emma, who immediately met a good friend who started helping her, and then the photographer was like, I've never seen a photographer in motion like that. She was kind of like <laughs> swirling around Emma and <laughs> taking pictures, and I was just trying to like stay, stay out of her way, and... You know, and then also trying to catch the faces of people as, as they were coming toward us. What was your experience of that? That was just a routine, taking the mattress back to the dorm. Yeah, um, it's always different when the camera's around because mm -hmm. um, I find that people are more likely to jump in and help if they don't see a camera because they might think, oh, something's happening, I don't want to disrupt yeah. it. Um, but I think that the guy who did end up jumping in, the guy with his cell phone, mm. and there was a guy on a cell phone who ended up jumping in despite the camera. And I think that he might have been so distracted by his phone that he didn't see it there. But that's because he stayed on his cell phone the whole time. Yeah, he yeah. <laughs> carried it like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so. then we got to her dorm and sat on a bench in front of it, and like four or five people going into the dorm stopped and asked if she needed help. So. That was an, it was like she had been talking to me in her studio about the mattress as a performance space and also as a social experiment, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And she started, and she told me an, a number of sort of good and not so good stories about interactions with people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I want to know is how is it going? How is it? I saw you on September 18th. You were barely three weeks in, two mm -hmm. and a half. Mm -hmm. It was a balmy autumn day. 
Yeah. <laughs> you were in a sleeveless dress. Um, I mean, how is it going? How has it changed for you? Has it gotten, how have the interactions changed, if at all? I remember you said the shuttle wasn't, didn't stop for you one time. Multiple it, times. The shuttle would see me and just go right past That's the Col wanna... Columbia University shuttle. Yeah, um, it's changed in a lot of ways since we talked. I mean, one of the biggest changes is that now I'm keeping a diary of what's going on, which I call my mattress diary. Uh, I started that on the fourth week, um, and it just sort of gives an account of the more private things that are happening that are, to me, integral parts of the piece, but to an outside observer wouldn't be apparent without the diary. Um, and then in terms of the interactions, I've started to actually, at, at first I conceived of the performance space as just the mattress, but the longer I live with this piece, the more I'm realizing that the performance space is beyond the mattress because it has to do with the way people interact with me through the internet um, and talk about mattress girl, whoever the F that is, and um, just, the, the mattress as a space is actually moves beyond. It's just, expanding. Yeah. Um, and I think that the diary has helped me see that a lot because I'm able to live my life and see when I'm having a performative moment that mm -hmm. is actually not connected to the physical mattress anymore mm -hmm. when a person comes up to me and treats me a certain way because of the piece or says, writes an article about the piece online. Um, or about me online, it feels like it's a part of the performance. It's hard to describe, but to me, the space is now expanded. But yeah. Well, I was I was just talking with your parents about the idea of the of this mattress creating a space that is both sort of like a bubble where mm -hmm. you have a completely unique view of the world. Like there's nobody else in in the vicinity that's doing this. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's completely porous, so that you have all this stuff coming at you all the time. Yeah. And has the feeling, ha, do you feel people have gotten used to you, or has, has? Well, it's interesting. Um, I definitely, like, if I'm taking the elevator by myself without the mattress, and someone gets on, it's just like, you know, another student in the elevator uh -huh. with me. If I'm in the elevator with the mattress, and another student gets on, they smile at me and then they stand next to me. It's a very different interaction, or if I'm walking down the street, no one will really acknowledge me, but if I'm carrying the mattress, people will like give me a thumbs up or smile at me, and it's a, yeah, I get treated differently when I'm with the mattress. Definitely. And are you, you said to me that you would be visiting your, you know, I assume you sort of know the rules of engagement are that she, she carries the mattress whenever she's on campus, and when she leaves campus, she leaves the mattress some, at home, like at, in your dorm. Yeah, either at home or in my studio. So uh, one thing I wrote about was when she goes out of the dorm to catch the subway, she has to walk around the perimeter of, of the campus and then back up to 116th to, to so catch So it's not the, to cut through the center of campus. Right. Um, and do you find that there's the same willingness to, for, are people still always helping you? And like you said, well anyway, I'll, I'll quote some things you said. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, it depends. Um, I've found that on, on these really, we've had a pretty bad, I've been very sensitive to weather lately. Oh, um, <laughs> so the past week and a half has been really rainy and people have not really been helping. Um, but on days when it's not raining, people are much more likely to help. Um, Usually if a person helps me on a rainy day, it's because they were in class with me and we're having a conversation with me after the class and then they feel awkward not helping me because they're talking to me already. And then they're like, okay, I'll help you carry it. <laughs> yeah, well you have to think about what that person who's alone with you in the elevator is thinking like, okay, do I, should I ask her? Should I not ask her if she needs help? You know, I mean, it, yeah. it puts, particularly that when you're solitary, isolated with you, it must mm -hmm. put an incredible kind of you know, you really experience this line between action and inaction, and mm -hmm. because that's sort of what's being acted by mm -hmm. by all the people that help you. Mm -hmm. I think also because I've gotten a lot better at carrying it now. Yeah, people, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for Thanksgiving break, I didn't carry it for five days, and I got back to school and I picked it up, and it felt so heavy just because I hadn't carried it for only five days. Um, but. 
Um, I've gotten a lot better at carrying it now, so I'm able to pr move pretty quickly with it, um, which doesn't mean that it's not really difficult and I'm panting and sweating and whatever, but um, people, I think also people, I, I'm, try I'm always trying to figure out why are people helping me less? Maybe they, they are less interested. Maybe I look more capable of carrying it now that I've gotten a little bit stronger. Um, but yeah, I imagine that maybe that's one of the reasons that people are, you know, when they're in that alone situation with me in the elevator and then they see me pick it up and I know how to pick it up now. Like I know exactly where I have to hold it. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, ah, oh, she's got it. Me, I'm just, you know, a hypothesis, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> okay, now I'm supposed to ask you a question right now. I don't have one. Um, <laughs> well, just to get back to logistics, this is another thing. <laughs> the photographer, especially since she probably works outdoors more than I do, we got really intent on talking to Emma about covers for the mattress <laughs> because we well, didn't you had think a particular that, one you wanted me to get. She did. She did. She had the name or something. Oh, I'm not sure I did. I didn't write but that. But she name. had. <laughs> it has this kind of ray. You know, it's a synthetic cover, but you said it wasn't totally waterproof. So that was another thing that we got stuck on, like, <laughs> is this going to absorb water when it gets rained on and yeah. get even heavier? Well, but now I have, I have, I found these, like, um, bed wetter, bed bug protection <laughs> dust cover sheets that have a That's zipper. what she suggested, yeah. Yeah. That's what Jennifer suggested. So, but they're not see-through, which I, I remember you were saying it should be see-through. I, I wasn't able to find that, and, you know, I just have to take what I can, and it's, kind of flimsy, so people often, when if they do help me when it's raining outside, they grab the cover and it just rips. So I have a few of those and sort of cycling through. Jesus. Yeah. Um, and have you had any more experience with uh, people, people who don't, who sort of invade your, your personal space? Because you, I mean, that's just what you were talking about, was this kind of formality mm -hmm. that accrues when you have it. You know, mm -hmm. you're, doing, you're doing your work, you're doing a piece. But are people still sort of, guys are making not quite appropriate remarks and? Um, I haven't, ex I'm trying to think. I can't, I haven't experienced that much um, since we last talked. Um, I think, I think people, um, even it, when they're trying to be helpful though, they have a little trouble understanding boundaries. like. If I'm carrying the mattress by myself, sorry, I just leaned. If I'm carrying the mattress by myself and someone just jumps in and helps me, they actually are knocking me off balance because if they jump up behind me and push the mattress up, they're actually throwing it over me. Mm -hmm. And um, I've dropped it a few times just because they don't understand that like you need to communicate with, I mean, it's, it's obvious, it, this is the language of consent, right? They need to communicate with me before they jump in and help. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a um, complete enactment. What? It's a complete enactment of that. Yeah, like, and I think, I mean, every interaction that is that falls along these lines inevitably has this sort of language attached to it, which I find very interesting. But um, yeah, if they don't, if they don't talk to me before they jump in and grab the mattress, then they're actually making life harder for me. Um, and I don't know if this is sexist or not, but. Does that, does that line between the people who do make contact and don't make contact, does that, is there any kind of gender specificity involved with that? Um, no, I think that's pretty equal. I have had um, people who like touch me on the street as if I'm a saint, as that's, they're, so they, <laughs> it's really, <laughs> they, um, like, they come up to me and go, thank you, which is, again, like, an, an I, I get that they're, it's all, um, they, they want to be kind to me, they want, I don't know, it's, a lo it's an act of love, but at the same time, they've just um, forgotten that I'm a person and I don't want strangers touching me on the street, um, so. You least of all. What? I said you least of all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, and I, that's happened with two, two men and one woman, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's a way that when you get in, start talking to her, you do get, if this is being a little too, like, minutia-oriented, I apologize, but I don't think people quite, I mean, you said this when we spoke, that people had said they didn't think it was any work, and they, they didn't really understand the extent 
to which this was worked out. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. preceded by a less successful work that was at, at Yale Norfolk that was then critiqued by students. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, and I was actually I was um, thinking about. Um, I'm never going to pronounce his name right ever, but Ta Ching Xie. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to pronounce his name? Um, the <laughs> artist who <laughs> um, he did pieces like. The, he did this one year-long piece where he um, had to punch a time card um, every hour on the hour um, for a year, which meant that he couldn't sleep for more than 55 minutes or whatever. He had about 10 year-long performances. Yeah. And one he was tied to Linda Montana. Yeah. Like about, about three feet. And then another time he s just sat in a cell. For a year. Yeah. Um, but the, way, the, I, the reason I bring him up is because we all think of that piece as like, okay, he did this piece where every hour on the hour he'd punch a card and then he couldn't sleep for more than an hour, he couldn't talk to someone for more than an hour before he had to run and punch the clock, you know, he, you can just imagine how crazy that was, but then you for, then when you return to the piece and you look at all the little details, like, they're so beautiful. There's this one thing, one detail that I'd for, never known about is that he had to um, record every mistake that he made and for what reason. So um, you can see that at the beginning of the piece that there's only um, one mistake in the first month and then there may be five mistakes in the, seventh, the second month. And then by the middle of the piece, he's, make, he's made 22 mistakes in one month and it's because of oversleeping or being late or being early. And I think that these little um, details to the piece give it so much more color and make me love the piece more. And I think that with my piece, it's people all know that I'm carrying a mattress around campus. People barely know how long I'm going to be carrying it for, but they have a vague idea that it's something to do with the fact that I'm on campus with rapist, with my rapist. But um, I think that the little details that, or the little things that happen in my life, such as people touching me on the street as if I'm a saint and not realizing that they're doing exactly what I don't want them to be doing by invading my personal space or people um, walking next to me for 10 blocks and not helping because it's an art piece and they're not supposed to touch it when really like I would love that help for the 10 blocks that they've walked next to me and like had a conversation oh, you with told me. me about this you had like yeah. four people helping you and then two people talking and walking in front of us smoking cigarettes in our face um, <laughs> and then they finally <laughs> then they finally said and then by the end, um, yeah, by the end of the walk, another person saw me and the four people, or no, me and the three people walking, and he was like, hey, do you guys want help? And then the two people who had been blowing smoke in our faces the entire time were like, oh, do you want help? And didn't realize <laughs> that they could have been helping us that entire time. But it's those little details that aren't covered in the general outline of my piece that I think are what are, the most exciting parts about it, to me, at least. They're sort of between the cracks of your different rules of engagement. Yeah. Yeah, and it was interesting also that you that you would work out choreographies. Like when, when Jennifer and I went down in the elevator, I just thought, well, she gets in first, and, she, and Emma said, no, you guys get in first. Like, she's already figured out <laughs> that that's how it works best. She, we get to the side, and she comes in and takes the available space. Um, I had a really intense reaction from readers about Emma's piece. And uh, a lot of them were favorable and really happy that the piece had been written and admired the work you're doing. And then some of them were not. And some of them, so I don't know if, I don't know what kind of reactions you had that you might want to talk about too, but I don't mean to put, I was mm, just gonna, yeah. I was just gonna read a couple of them. Um, uh, and this may be something that I just don't know about, but, pe but other people will be, will know about it somebody who wrote in about a political art story in the 60s when a famous Columbia University sociology professor was accused of sexual harassment of female students behind the closed door of his office. Some radical women graduate students removed his office door and kept it. <laughs> <laughs> thereby, letting, thereby letting the office's gaping openness stand as a testimony to his misbehavior and their power. So That's I, awesome. And they wanted to know if you knew about this history. My answer is no. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. 
Um, and then the other one I, I just loved was one of my best memories. Basically, they're saying Aeschylus did it better. You know, one of my best memories as a freshman at, at, at Columbia College was an outdoor performance of, Agamemnon, of the Agamemnon of Aeschylus, a far more powerful indictment of what men do to women. Both as... <laughs> Can't beat Aeschylus. And this is, this is probably, <laughs> goes without saying, this is someone who has not actually seen Emma's piece, you know. Both as drama and spectacle, it was overwhelming, as was Miles Davis's Sketches of Spain, which was used as the background music. And wait, <laughs> wait for it. If my memory serves me correctly, this was also accompanied by the passage of Sputnik over Low Library. Wow. Well, I should have gotten <laughs> Sputnik involved. <laughs> Man, um, I really overlooked that one. And the, <laughs> the one that hurt my feelings the most was this kind of harsh letter from a woman who wrote in and it was sort of like I had overlooked this glaring fact. And she, in fact, it was just a, more, a further interpretation of Emma's work. And she said, well, you should have said that she's carrying a, a weight and that the administration doesn't give any weight to her words. I thought, yeah, I should have said that. Thank you. <laughs> you horrible critic. I don't. You. <laughs> I don't think. I, I don't think of everything. Um, but that it was pretty. It was interesting. That, just a lot of them. Um, Do you have other ones you want to share? I, I don't. Um, those were the only three that seemed. There was. There, there was a number of people who wrote and said, "Well, you know, it's too bad you're not writing about interesting art." You know. Well, mm. You know. And. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't be making interesting art. <laughs> Not for them. And I'd always write back and say, that's just a matter of opinion, you know, it's like a statement of fact. Um, Not interesting. Yeah, I guess I've just, I've been excited to see the, um, the, there, there were a few other critique, opinion, like, a, yeah, reviews, I guess, of my piece that um, I always like seeing the, um, artists that they say I'm in the lineage of because I never, like we were sort of talking about this before when we were sitting outside, um, but I, I had the idea for this piece and it wasn't like, oh, how can I convey this message? Let me research artists, let me find inspiration from somewhere. It was just sort of like, I wanna carry a mattress everywhere and I don't know why, let me unpack that idea. Oh, it's because of my assault, it's because of Columbia, it's because, so, when people say this is in the lineage of, um, I, I don't know, whatever artist, Marina Abramovich, for example, I'm like, oh, that's so interesting, and I... In fact, um, I mentioned her. Yeah, and I don't, and I, I didn't notice these things before, so I always enjoy reading the reviews that people write. Um, and then, um, I guess in terms of the weirdest things I've seen or received online are... Oh, well, one of the best ones was when a woman wired me $100 for a massage because she said my shoulders must be tired. That's nice. <laughs> did you, get, really did you that. take her up on it? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, and then on the other hand, there recently uh, Su Suzanne Fields wrote this article um, explaining that about how I'm crying rape and she has her whole scientific analysis of why I must be lying because, um, and she even went back to my rapist argument um, back when we were in the hearing process. He said that um, there's no way he could have pinned my legs down because I was an athlete, so I had very strong legs and I could have pushed him off. Um, and she, so she returns to that argument and says, of course, like, See, this proves that it couldn't have happened, and this is You're all too show. strong for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, it's just strange to see people dissecting what was for me such a traumatic experience, and then giving their own analysis of it's just you know no other few other people on earth have ha ever had to see that. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the common argument against that is that why would a woman do this to herself? Like why would yeah. You, why would you tell this story, subject yourself to this? Really, I mean, really, it's a kind of ordeal, what, what you're doing. A kind of ordeal. And I, don't, I think it's, <laughs> I mean, I think it's actually kind of, you know, 
probably unprecedented in terms of just the longevity of it, the kind of open-endedness of it, mm -hmm. and just the real physical labor. I mean, mm -hmm. it has great symbolism, and I, even before, you know, when I was reading about it, and when my, my enterprising editor came up and said, you've got to do this, um, it had this kind of clarity. Like, I sort of knew I would get up there and I, I would write a piece, because it just, you know, it's really, it really broadcasts it as a work of art, um, which is something we might talk about. Thanks. Um, I, took, I took notes ex extensively during our conversation, and, and I just have some phrases that Emma, things that Emma said, which may be modified by my sloppy note-taking process, so she can affirm or deny, but I just thought I'd read through them to sort of, you would get an idea of how our conversation went, although I've moved them out of sequence a little bit, some of the things we've already talked about. Um, this piece really began when Emma went to the police with her story and recorded it. And she, she referred to the, re the recording as real material that I could work with. She also said that the piece, you may want to stop and explain this, particularly since your parents who are practicing psychiatrists are here, she said, <laughs> it's better than therapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I guess I can explain sort of that whole police situation. Um, so when I first came out with my story, um, I was on the front page of the Times, and um, it was just a, an article about what happened to Emma and these other women at Columbia. What's up? Well, you were in the lead. You were the yeah, first thing in the article. The I remember who, reading yeah. this before. You weren't named, I don't think. I was named in the New York Times article. You were okay. Um, and uh, so after that, I got all these emails from people being like, uh, I'm, I'm happy you told your story, blah, blah, but um, you should have gone to the police. It's a mistake. Um, why didn't you go to the police? Pe girl, and I would see people commenting on things online saying, girls are so dumb, they should go to the police. And I was like, all right, there's a big fuss about going to the police. I have five years, my case can be um, statute of limitations. Yeah, that statute of limitations is five, year, is five years long. I can go to the police now. If you guys are so smart about the police being the best people to deal with this, then let me trust you and do that. So I called the, I called the police after my last exam that semester um, and recorded everything that happened. Um, and of course... At, when you went in to see them. Um, oh, you started recording. The first responders came to my dorm, oh. um, told me that my, my friend and my boyfriend couldn't be with me when I talked to them, had them sit in my room, then conducted their investigation or basically harassing me in the hallway of my dorm, and I recorded everything. Um, and um, I never listened to that. You know, I ended up going to the special victims unit. The people there weren't very understanding either. Um, but I... So I had that audio recording of them saying things like, so he got a little weird that night. And then I'd be like, no, he raped me that night. So he got a little weird that night, you agree? And then I'd be like, what, why are you using that language? He, you know, it was stuff like that. Um, and so then, so yeah, I never listened to that recording, but I got to Yale and I, to the Yale residency that summer and I made a video um, using that audio, but to make the video, I had to carry a bed out of... A well, that was the performance that you were recording. Yeah. Was, well, was dismantling a bed and taking it out into the front yard and Yeah, well, at first the it, video I... was, I was going to use the recording and not do that, but to use the room that I wanted to make do the performance mm -hmm. in, I had to take a bed out of the room and move all the furniture out, and then the idea of me moving a bed out of the room sort of got stuck in my head, and then I decided to make a video where I took a bed out of a house piece by piece, and I ended up using that footage with the audio. Um, but then, yeah, in the final critique, um, people were like, it's weird that it ends in this house. This house is not that relevant to the audio because the audio has to do with Columbia and what happened at Columbia. And then I was like, I should carry this mattress at Columbia. Why do I want to carry this mattress at Columbia? And then I. That's where the piece started. 
And then you spent quite a while working out the, ter uh, the terms of engagement, rules of engagement? Yeah, the rules of engagement. I spent the entire summer from the moment I got back till the first day of school perfecting the rules of engagement. They were very different um, when I started the year off. Um, and I, uh, you know, figuring out how to get a mattress because the people who sell mattresses to Columbia don't sell mattresses to individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting my mattress from this place called Tall Paul's Tall Mall, which is a store for... <laughs> That's it. I was trying to... It's in my notes. I thought, what is that? <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's an online store for tall people. So... <laughs> Who need dorm room um, size mattress, I, I guess. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, because they're extra long for oh, tall people. Right. Yeah. But... Anyway, I'm, you can go through your notes more. That was a long tangent. Well, one of the most interesting things you said, which I think got edited out of my piece, was that um, you became an artist with this piece. And I think that that's really important. This, this, was, this kind of summer of compression toward clarity that you had, where, and you said it was um, made me an artist before I'd only ever really done art by assignment. So there's this very abrupt shift and you have this experience where you told yourself it was a whole different idea of art for you. Something that's asking to be made, I told myself, I need to do this now. The world really needs to, this now. And that's where I asked the question about, is this a weird messianic artist impulse, artistic impulse? And then you had this great answer. You said, I'm never really doing it myself. That, that is every, I wish I had said that now. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if I could have worded that as well now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I definitely see um, my life as pre this summer when I was, when to me art was, you know, fulfilling an assignment for a class, like make a monument out of wood, and that was my art. But I, now I look at that and I think that's not art. Art is, to me at least, it's made out of necessity and like I definitely feel like there was a force greater than me that was... Um, compelling me to make this piece because I felt like, you know, it's, yeah, and I agree, I agree with the Emma that said that because <laughs> I did feel like the world needed it. I felt like it was more than just something that I wanted to do. It was something that I had to do for fixing a problem or fixing or for people, yeah. Which explains the public nature of it. <laughs> <laughs> and the long and the, and the real endurance, the enduring, you know, the open-endedness. Um, you also said, "I have no idea what I'm doing after this." Actually, that's changed now. That's really? another big change. I don't know if I, I don't think that this is the place for me to say what my next pieces are. But I'm going to be working on my next pieces over winter break. So. And will they be of the performance kind? They'll be performative. Um, I, I can back up a little because you were you major you were majoring in sculpture, in, right? In visual art. Oh, I thought it was. A, but, but there had been an emphasis in your in what you were doing on sculpture. Mm, not really. It was just sort of uh, at at Columbia. The visual arts major is you can um, uh, you just take studio classes that you're interested in, and as long as you take a certain number of them, you have the visual arts major. So I was taking mostly photography, and I took painting, drawing, sculpture, and photography. So. But did you or did you not characterize the work before this as being about rage and violence against women? Oh, I think, um, I remember, this... yeah. Well, so there were like particular sculptures that I made yeah. that definitely evoked that, um, and, you talked about violence as a formal configuration. So it was like something you were trying to get into shapes and... Yeah, like, I mean, there's this one sculpture I'm thinking of where I created this. No, it's too weird to talk about, but yeah, I definitely... <laughs> okay, okay, we can move on. <laughs> um, the, yeah, there's, def there's definitely, like, I think the verbs that you would use to describe the process that I had, that I used to mm -hmm. make the sculptures that I was making were all very, like, violent words. Um, and then I, I, I took um, photography my entire junior year, so that, was, that would have been before I talked to you. And I, I think that most of my photographs sort of had this 
tinge of. Well, that's a, of the event. Yeah. Yeah, of, of the assault. Being, yeah. Oh, yeah. Since the assault, I took um, sculpture and photography. And this and was before you'd really anywhere. sort of c compressed it down to this very clear. Yeah. Sort of. Um, yeah. And then you said, well, you said once it once uh, once this is over, I'm definitely going to be searching, which you kind of covered. Then you said, art is powerful. It's something that moves people. This is the crash course in, and then I have EXP of power. So expression, experience of power. <laughs> this is a note taking. You can't just be protesting things. That was one thing you said. Mm -hmm. um, that as a personal, yeah, I, I mean, to me, I wouldn't be satisfied just going to rallies um, and speaking at rallies. Uh, and I do, I've been thinking about the power thing a lot lately because I think that um, on the meta level of my piece, there's this really um, strange dialectic going on where, you know, I'm powerless because the school has done these things to me, my rapist has done these things to me, um, the police have treated me like crap, um, and ultimately I'm forced to, if I want this education, to continue going to school with my rapist. At the same time, because of this piece, um, for example, all of public safety at my school had to have a, an emergency meeting where they told them, you're gonna get fired if you don't pick up Emma at the shuttle stop. Like, there is this weird <clears throat> that, you know, way in which um, I'm powerless and powerful at the same time. Um, often, I, like, my pure emotional feeling is powerlessness, even, um, because we were talking about how um, or it has something to do with the fact that I felt like I was I had to make this piece or like a force was sort of yeah, I mean, me my memory is that when it, when we were talking about you you said something like I'm still crying every day yeah <laughs> <laughs> I am um, which is not a laughing matter but um, yeah I definitely it's I think people see me as this hero or that's one thing I was that that's one of the one of the passages I read um I did a we had our um final thesis show on Thursday and um at the show I did a reading where I selected um passages from the diary I've been keeping and one of the passages I selected um was about this whole treating me as a hero thing because that's been something I've been thinking about a lot, a lot lately. <clears throat> um, this one woman came up to me and uh, said, um, I was talking to my friend recently and she asked me if there was one person I had to choose to teach my eight-year-old son about, who would that person be? And then she looks at me and goes, and I said, you. And I started crying because I, I just don't. Teach him about what? Just she would teach him about me as. Uh huh. Um, oh, I see. You would be the subject. Okay, yeah. Sorry. If there was one person she had, to, she would choose to teach her eight-year-old son about. She would choose me, which and then I started just crying in front of her because I don't. I mean, even these po like the positive way that people sort of have treated me is really stressful as well. Um, it's just a lot of responsibility. Um, and I just don't feel like, I, I don't know, I feel like I'm so, I'm, I'm 22 now, I've had a birthday since I started the piece and I just don't feel like I have the wisdom that these people, or you know what I, it's this, there's this That you're sort of operating by instinct still. You yeah, know, just, and just... people are like, you're a hero, I'm gonna teach my son about you, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so. Should I ask my question of you? I don't, yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah. I don't know, where, did you have other quotes you Well, I was just going to finish up, just sort okay. of to go you, back you to the logistics. That one thing that struck me, um, just, this is just a little detail, but she said, we were talking about the carrying techniques. Yeah. And you said you would not roll it up, that would fetishize it. Oh, you know, yeah. In addition to making your job easier, by the way, but 
you know, or maybe, maybe not, but I always thought that was like how conscious all this stuff was, you know, that no, there's not going to be a rope involved. There's not, there's not going to be that kind of process. Yeah, that was actually the other, um, the other, one of the other things I read from my mattress diary the other day had to do with the idea of fetishizing it because um, there was one day that um, uh, I was walking to the shuttle stop and um, a homeless person came up to me and was, starting, was trying to get my attention. And I've always been very anxious about this kind of stuff because um, there's a reason that I'm, this, this piece is very site specific because if I were to carry this piece all over New York City, for example, it would be a piece about homelessness. And while I'm, th I'm happy about those connotations and the, the references that it has to that, I don't want it to be about homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, so I was interested in what would happen when I had this interaction with a homeless person with the mattress. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he, he just saw me struggling and wanted to help. And I was like, oh, you don't, wor like, don't worry, you don't have to help. And he was like, no, let me help. And he brought over his shopping cart. Um, and I, I don't wanna, I've been resisting using any wheels or straps to carry the mattress because I do believe that so it suddenly becomes this fetishized object, like, oh, I'm pushing my mattress around on wheels. I don't know, it just feels wrong to me, and it's about, to me, the piece is about an honest struggle with the mattress and not trying to come up with tricks to get around that. Right, to me, make it, it seems easier. dishonest. Yeah. yeah. So, but when this um, person came up with his shopping cart, to me, it was actually one of the most honest encounters I'd ever had with anyone because he was coming to this piece with no knowledge of why I was carrying it. Right. And he was also the first person in the history of the piece to offer help, not because he'd seen me on the news or not because he'd heard about me from a friend, but because he just saw like a pure visual experience. He saw me as a person struggling to carry this mattress and wanted to do whatever he could to help. So, so he tolerated it being in the... Yeah, and I was like, you know what? like. You're right, yeah, let's use let's your shopping cart. It. That's the way to do it. And yeah. we had a great conversation. <laughs> he told me about his sister. Um, yeah, and it, I, I was really happy about that experience. And that was, I think if, I, if wheels are ever introduced to this piece, it has to be in a very honest way like that. Right. Yeah. Um, and just to catch up a, on a couple of other things, uh, in the um, Vanessa Gregory Artist article, is that the one that quotes Lee Bollinger saying he feels really bad about what you're doing? He likes to get that quote out there wherever he can. Has, aside from doing things like you have to pick up Emma Silkowitz or be fired, has there been any other response from the administration? Any, any attempt to approach you or um, any attempt to reconsider what might have happened? What happened? Um, no. Uh, my, my parents wrote... Um, an op-ed sort of explaining everything that happened um, in the hearing process, and he wrote them a sort of snarky uh, reply um, that was not, it wasn't substantial at all. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, you know, the, administrator, the administrators aren't going to take anything onto, onto themselves in order to help me. They're just going to yell at their workers, the public safety shuttle drivers, mm -hmm. about it. Um, mm -hmm. Because so. they don't want to look bad in yeah. that kind of minute way, yeah. as opposed to the larger way in which they seem really committed to looking bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and in terms of, to, just to continue the fetishization conversation, so this goes all the way through and becomes, you know, I think more and more interesting to think about kind of, you know, you go... You end up at commencement. Oh, here's a, here's a tiny question, because I think it's on everybody's mind, and we're probably embarrassed to ask it, but have you seen uh, the man? With your, have, you, have you come across him on campus with your mattress? Um, no, actually, a lot of people ask me that question. It's not that weird. Um, but uh, I've seen him twice without, well, when I wasn't carrying a mattress, once before school started, so before the piece mm -hmm. started, and then one time when I was... Like, Off actually, I was purchasing paint, on, and I was bringing it to my studio, and I saw him on that walk to write the rules of engagement. But I never, that, that was at the beginning of the year, and I haven't seen him with the mattress, but 
I figure that's because when I'm carrying the mattress, I can't see 50% of the world. Right. Um, so he's like dodging so, on the other I mean, side of yeah, the mattress. Yeah, he could, uh, he could be dodging me or I just might not, I have no peripheral vision, so mm -hmm. I might not be able to see him. And then in terms of fetishization, so this, however long, prob probably it looks like commencement, don't you think? Um, yeah, and I sort of, I sort of. Unless he just sort that. of dies of shame and embarrassment or something. <laughs> Guilt. Um, <laughs> so, what is the mattress after you graduate? Is because I can imagine, like the Museum of Modern Art or another museum, being really interested to acquire it. In which case, it's installed, leaning against the wall, probably looking pretty shabby by <laughs> by the end of the year, with a label explaining what had happened. Mm -hmm. But does the does the mattress live on in any aesthetic way or artistic way? I have this whole plan or image of how I would want <laughs> the installation to look, and it would be an installation, um, because I want the rules of engagement to be painted on the white wall mm -hmm. of the museum. It would look pretty much like it does in my studio. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd want all of the wet bedwetter, the torn up bedwetter sheets to be on display as well, maybe in a pile or however they want to mm -hmm. do it. I don't really care. Um, and then uh, the mattress diary, I'd want that to be uh, maybe on an iPad so that you could scroll through it. Because I've been typing it. It's not mm -hmm. a handwritten thing. Um, or some, some way that people could read it next to it. Mm -hmm. So it would be the... And then those all those gloves things. you're going to get. Oh, get yeah. you through the and next the gloves, four months. The, the gloves that I'm getting, I'm hopefully getting for Secret Time. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm dreaming for. <laughs> um, yeah, so all the, all the tools and the diary and the painting. Okay, do you want to ask me questions or? Sure. Or is there anything, is there anything we haven't spoken about um, that you want to say? No, I think we've covered the bases on, on my part. Or we could just, I don't know what our time is looking like, but we can move to questions. Oh, come on, give me a question, just one. I just oh, want to okay. see what you came up with. Um, okay, so in my philosophy of art class, we were reading, of course, Arthur Danto's art, The Art World Revisited. <laughs> um, and I'm going to read a paragraph from it, from it. It is instructive to observe the way members of the art world respond to works of a kind encountered for the first time when the task is to lay down something like a piece of theory of the work, and then against this, some appraisal of it, as critics, for example, are called upon to do with great frequency. Roberta Smith, a critic for the New York Times, once told me that this is the part of her job which she finds the most appealing. Often, she will be the first one to write about a given artist with no available history or theory to help her since the artist is quite unknown. So that's what happened. <laughs> when you came to my studio, and I was wondering, um, I was wondering if you could describe the steps you took to decide that my piece was art, um, because I think that, I mean, maybe to you and I, it's obvious, but I think um, it was definitely. I mean, I I was nervous before you came for a reason, um, <laughs> so I was wondering if you could talk about that. Well, I think I've sort of touched on it already when I said that kind of clarity where, where the, uh, another favorite word of mine is economy. Like there's nothing you can take away from your piece. It all is essential to it, like the rules of engagement and, and just the kind <laughs> of utter simplicity of this act. And yet how complicated it becomes symbolically, emotionally, you know, how it's this act of, of assertion, and then sometimes it's, it's, it's sort of self-denigrating. I mean, it's just, you know, maybe even kind of self-sacrificial. Like, you can just sort of move around it and get a full, a full spectrum of emotion. And I don't, you know, it's funny, because like I said, I, from a distance, I thought, yeah, I would, I would go see this and, and figure it out. But I don't really figure it out. You know, I just, I just know that I took about 20 pages of notes and then followed you across the canvas, a campus, and then by the time I got to the other side, it was like, yeah, I can, I, there's a piece here. I can do this. It's sort of just, and that's really the way I write. I mean, I, Danto's totally right. I mean, I love the fact that I can write about people 
before anybody else does. And um, that's what journalistic criticism is about. And there are other people who write, like Danto writes essays. I don't write essays. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of writing more reports from the front. And that's, you know, then I want to do that and go on to the next thing or, you know. And by the way, if you start showing somewhere, I probably would not write about you. <laughs> <laughs> because our situation is totally contaminated, mm -hmm. you know. I try to keep those things kind of separate. So, cool. but anyway, we'll see. So, I guess we should open it up to questions now. Hi. Um, I, have, uh, I have a longer question and then a very quick, short question. My longer question has to do with me on the National Day of Action in which students worldwide all picked up mattresses as well, and students who may have previously only been engaged with issues of sexual assault on college campuses with rallies and protests also entered a performative space. And I wondered what your thoughts were on that matter. And then my quick question is, are you planning on bringing your mattress with you to the graduation ceremonies? Um, I mean, I was really excited about the National Day of Action. I thought it was amazing. Um, over 130 schools participated in over five countries. Um, so that was amazing. Um, yeah, I think, I, I don't, just, I loved it. Um, <laughs> uh, it was a really wonderful day. Um, and then in terms of graduation, I do have a plan for graduation. I have this vague image of myself going to shake whoever's hand I'm supposed to shake on that day, maybe the dean and maybe the president, I don't really know, and then just dropping the mattress there at their feet. And that will be... <laughs> Just letting them carry that weight for a yeah. while. Let's see what it's like, guys. <laughs> so, and that would be the end, I think. So, hey, I know you. I am. <laughs> um, my question is: I'm interested. The physical strain is evident, of course. But has carrying this mattress around, or continuing this performance art piece, has it proved to be more of a have a, a cathartic? Farces to it in regards to your experience or your relationship with your perpetrator, or has it been more of an accumulation of rage because you have to carry this fucking mattress around? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an interesting question because what I've been finding is that whenever people ask me questions about my emotions, I'm so laden with emotions at any given moment that it's really hard to pick them apart and to quantify them. I'm just, it's been, I mean, from the moment I, um, I came out with my story, it's just been a roller coaster. Um, so I think that well, you know what? Right now, I have, the biggest question I have is like, why does this? Why does Paul want to stay at Columbia? Like, I'm, yeah. I'm questioning that. And then, like, the longer he stays there, the more angry I am with him. So, um, I, I am angrier with him than I've ever been in my life. Um, and the the mattress piece, I don't know. I guess it's just a thing I have to be doing. Like, I, I need to do for my, yeah, it's a strange feeling, like, when you have, you, yeah, you have to be doing something. Um, again, like we were talking about earlier, that feeling that there's a force greater than myself that's making it that I need to be doing this thing. And I don't know if it's either helping or making things worse for my emotions, so, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, um, I wrote just a small write-up on this event for Brooklyn.com, just this is happening, people should come. And I got so many negative and hateful comments and it affected me for a number of reasons. Um, I was a date rape survivor as well and I think what you're doing is so brave and so powerful. So just knowing how much that upset me from that perspective, how do you deal with people that are saying things like, oh, she could be lying, 
think what she's doing to this poor guy? Um, I mean, those, there's no way to not be upset about that stuff, I think. Um, every time another commenter online says something, it hurts a little bit. Um, in the end of the day, I, um, I'm not gonna like argue back with those people because there's a reason they're attacking you from the veil of anonymity online, right? They're not brave enough to say it to your face. Um, and I found that like people have, will say the meanest things online. One person said, Emma is ISIS, let's bomb her. Her mattress makes a good target. But no one would ever say that to my face because th that person's probably a coward. So yeah, there's, I, I, don't, I don't really know, there, I don't have advice, but it's just sort of a casualty, I guess. But, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Rita Helen Jennison from Women B News. And I, I have, there's layers within layers, just in your performance. One of them is the rape of campus women. How long has it been standard operating procedure? It's, it's been at least two decades, probably more. And we haven't heard from the women who were, who were, who didn't have the option for whatever reason to protest publicly. And I guess secondly, the Justice Department released its data just last week that women of color, low income women are much higher risk that, uh, of being raped than college age women or women in college. So there's this whole layer within layer is this very public movement uh, about the impunity of men on campus, is it is it designed to expand? Will it is it, will it really attack male impunity? I guess that is my question. Um, and deal with the other problems that you just brought up. Um, the thing is that I'm not really the the. To me, it seems strange because I'm not really the. I think I've been framed as the leader of a movement and that I have a lot of control over this movement, but really, in the way I see it, like I'm just a person making an art piece that seemed to be an appropriate symbol for a movement. Um, I think that the, like, the real, the activists who have been doing the most work um, have also been the activists that, like, um, I don't want to say reappropriate because that has negative connotations, but have been using IPs to further that. And I don't think that, as, as an artist, I, can I personally can really only make artwork about my experience and what's going on in my life. And I think it would be sort of dishonest to be making work for the, and speaking for someone else. Um, so I, so right now I'm just sort of making artwork that comes from my heart, right? And there's not much I can do to like say, all right, now I'm going to make the activism have a different slant, or um, now I'm going to change the course of this. Um. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is that Right now, I, I can only do what I can do, which is make art. And then the activism stuff is, at least from what I've been seeing, um, completely organic and has been happening like because hundreds of people on the campus decide they all want to work together at a certain point. Or people make a Facebook group and all these activists have been talking to each other. Um, that's less under my control. But of course, like I want all those things that you want. and. Like, if I had the power to do those things, I wouldn't be doing those things. But right now, I just have to make the artwork I can make. Yeah. Um, well, I did want to say, um, as uh, a fellow rape survivor, I guess, thanks for being so brave to do this. I'm an artist, too, and I, it's never something I'm able to confront in my work, because um, it's just so scary. But, um, and I think 
it's really brave what you're doing. Uh, but I'm curious as to how um, Columbia's response has affected your healing process, and it seems that everything they've done has really only added insult to injury, as far as I can imagine. And at this point, even if your rapist were to leave, do you feel like um, your protest or the protest aspect of your work would be completed? Um, or is there still something left there, like if you were to imagine that? Um, well, if he left, I would be very grateful because I would no longer have to carry a mattress around. But I um, have, I think that this whole experience has shown me other problems with the way we talk about rape and the way we talk to survivors that I didn't see before, especially in the way that um, the news treats survivors, such as, um, for example, when I first came out with my story and I'd been interviewed by a ton of different um, newspapers and whatever, um, other new newspapers were starting to email me asking if I knew of any other rape survivors that would want to come out for the first time on their um, blog or their TV show. And I realized that um, survivors are being treated as commodities in a way. Um, it's a thing that will make your newspaper sell, especially seeing what's been happening with this whole UVA thing. Um, so I think that, I mean, that's just one of the many things that this work has shown me that I feel like I need to fix, or um, the artistic impulse in me is starting to get <laughs> excited about. Um, so yeah, it's not done. Um, I just think that there's, that um, my practice needs to expand in a certain way. Hi. Um, I'm actually an alum. I graduated in 2012, and I refuse to donate. Um, but I also, you mentioned, <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> um, you mentioned that Fresbo actually wrote a snarky letter to your parents. Has he ever engaged with you at all? You know, I don't know. Of course not. <laughs> yeah. no. Well, when I graduated, I actually got in trouble because I hugged Presbo, and apparently you're not supposed to touch him. <laughs> because he's actually a hologram, and he doesn't yeah. want you to know that your arms will pass through. <laughs> no, I think it's ironic that, you know, I invaded his personal space, and, you know, He's not defending the invasion of yours. I don't know. I'd like to talk to that. Okay. Thank you. Can yeah. I go first? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's a kind of hierarchy in the art world right now of, of this feeling that art should be engaged with social values, which, which are changing the world, which implies that art isn't enough, that art is not doing its job. And I re react very negatively to that idea. I think that an artist has to do, as Jasper Johns says, what you are helpless to do. 
It has to come out of absolute necessity. And lots of different artists have to make lots of different art. And some of it's going to be overtly political. I think basically all art is political in some way if you really break it down. And I think that art has gotten, in a way that's very interesting, has gotten very fuzzy around the borders. So in terms of activist art, you could talk about like how much of this, how much of any given artwork like Emma's is activism and how much is art? And what, what is the kind of balance where you experience its form, what you could call its form, which is her thinking about it and her clarity, and then you get a kind of message. And I think that there may be some kind of ratio where it, when it becomes more activism than art, it's totally useful and it can have great impact, but I don't necessarily want to look at it in a museum. I think it should be out on the street, you know, and it's not, it's so, I mean, that's a really, a really complicated question, but I, I think that it, it's incumbent if you're, going to, if you're going to be as much an, act, an artist as an activist, you really can only do what's in you, and you have to make something of it. You can't just kind of a, adopt a cause or a, a, a subject that's sort of out here. It can't be done in your head, and I think if you look back at art, it's always come from that, you know, and, um, that, that's really important to us. So, you know, I would say like Romare Bearden, all kinds of people, they're doing what, what only they can do. And I think that Emma is sort of in this situation. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything quite like this in terms of what she has set up and this kind of pe peculiar, you know, I think successful balance between as, you know, like, this great definition between subject matter and content, Dorothea Rockburn said, you know, subject matter is what a work is about, and content is what it does. And her, this piece really does something, in addition to having this very specific subject. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, Another way of thinking about it that I thought, or that I was um, interested in was, um, I don't remember who you were quoting, Dad, but you quoted someone when you said this. Um, <laughs> someone was explaining my piece as not like 50% activism, 50% art, but art that sparked change, um, and art, like, art that had the power to transform something, which I think, was ex I think, yeah, I thought that was a pretty good way of Kevin Rudd. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that was a good way of saying it, just because um, I, I agree. Art is something, the way that I've started to see it now is that art is something you make by necessity. And um, I, this is why when someone asked, a, you, when you asked a question earlier, I was saying, I can only make the art that comes from me. I can't make art to speak for someone else. I think that would just be morally wrong, but also like I, I don't know how to do it. Um, and so I think by nature I'm sort of an activist person and um, I think that's the artistic expression of my activist nature, so yeah. Hi, I'm also a 2012 alum and I've been a slightly involved in some of the discussions about what should change at the university level and, and what students want to see change in terms of policy responding to sexual assault. Um, I'm wondering what you care about seeing change in, you know, in an ideal world, if we can even think of that, um, how the university would respond differently to survivors. Um, it's just that I think that when we get into this conversation, it, it goes into so many little details that it almost might be better for you to just read the document we wrote up, like, uh, which I can send to you. Um, but I mean, for example, they would, I'm just thinking about the process from A to Z, um, they would record the investigative sessions with the survivors rather than having a person take notes and they added this new thing to the policy where now the investigator gives a 
and evalu a subjective evaluation of, the, of both the survivor and the respondent's credibility that they hand to the hearing panel. So the investigator thinks, oh, she doesn't, she sounds like kind, of, she doesn't sound like a credible person. They will tell that to the panel. Like little things, so many little things along the way that I would change. Um, for example, oh my gosh, I'm gonna give so many for examples. Like they wouldn't allow a case, to, my case they allowed to drag on for seven months just because every time they scheduled a hearing, my rapist said, oh, I have to study for a midterm and then they would postpone it for another week. And um, they wouldn't do stuff like that. They, you know, it's so many things. Um, but I can send you the link if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can only start by echoing all the thanks and support and appreciation from everybody in this room and everybody outside this room who's heard about your work and appreciates what you're doing. Um, I can't say that enough, so I'm not going to try to. Um, I come from, or I go to a small college in Minnesota, and I come from the activist communities on campus um, where we did organize um, involvement, like participation in the National Day of Action, and that was really exciting for us. Um, to um, follow your model in kind of engaging in a new and, and visually arresting way, really, um, on this issue. And I was struck by something that you said earlier this afternoon about how going to rallies and speaking at rallies is like, wouldn't be enough. That the art as your expression of your experience is something that's critical. And I'm wondering, like, we as activists against um, sexual violence can learn from that and take to what we're doing on our campuses across the country. Um, how can we bring some of that expression into our work and I don't, I don't know if that's a question that makes sense. No, it makes sense. Um, I would say that none of what I'm saying is prescriptive at all. Like, um, just, for example, I founded No Red Tape with Zoe Rodolfi Star, and then I basically don't really participate in No Red Tape. Zoe does all that because she's the, I think like if Zoe and I are yin and yang, I'm the artist and she's the activist. Um, and then we create this thing that's going on at Columbia. But if it weren't for her, you know, no red tape would not be happening. Um, or, you know, running all these rallies, passing out flyers, like all the things that they need to do. And I think that there's that um, going to rallies and doing all the activist stuff is so extremely important. And I don't think that, I think that I, it's not that I think that the rallies aren't enough. It's just that for me as a restless person who needs to be making artwork or else I go crazy, I don't think it'd be enough for me. And you know, I don't go to, like I, I'm, I'm not really a rally kind of person. Like I kind of show up late and feel awkward while I'm there. And <laughs> um, I, I think that I meant it's not enough for the way I live my life, but um, I think it's it's so so important, you know. And um, yeah, I hope that's a good answer to your question. If I've, there's a yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't want. If there's a way that we can make space for um, or draw attention to artists like you who are. Um, um, Working, working in this the same issue, subject to topic. Um, what is what is a way that we can do that? I don't know if that's an easy question to answer. Either. Um, I guess just support them. If an artist comes up to you and says, "I have an idea for an art piece, and I think it would work well if we, if I think that it'd be amazing if we could work together." Support them. 
we need a lot of support. Being an artist is a scary thing. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Um, I think it's a really um, powerful project, and <clears throat> I really appreciate how honest and vulnerable you are about, you know, you, mostly about talking about this piece, not just the piece. And I was curious if the rules of engagement or something you've thought about before, if you have anything planned for if the rapist does decide to help you one day with the mattress. Um, it would be, that would be really interesting. I, I'd probably, I don't know. I have to act in the moment. Ah, that's a really scary question. <laughs> I doubt he would. Right? <laughs> yeah, helping you does not mean he doesn't have to say he's sorry, you know? Yeah. Also, there is a no contact policy. So if he does contact me, maybe he could get kicked out. That would be more interesting. <laughs> that might Rather be. Rather than leaving the school, like getting kicked out because he's sorry about I mean, I'm just making up scenarios. Um, if he contacts me, um, maybe that would be. Like, he would probably get kicked out. Look, if he wanted to say he was sorry, he wouldn't be doing like some of the awful things he's, you know, he's not. There are other ways to say that he's sorry than jumping in and helping me with carry this mattress. And if he did that, it would probably be a violation of the no contact policy and he'd probably get kicked out, which would end the peace. So I don't know. Maybe that would be a crazy chain of events, but yeah. Thank you. Interesting, interesting scenario. I think we're going to take two more questions. Good call. Um, I'm not really fascinated by uh, the fact that this guy is at campus and staying at campus, and you know, it just seems so bizarre because, as much as you're a symbol for rape survivors, he's you know the symbol of rapists, um, and it's like everyone hates you. What are you doing? Um, so my question for you is, um, you know, do, do you hear stories about um, him and like what, like why, like any rationale? Do people, I mean, I can imagine people probably, like your friends, do they ever interact with him and tell him like leave? Um, when you saw him on the street, did he like cower or what's he kind of, uh, you know, more? Um, the first time I saw him before school started, um, like before the piece started, he just glared at me while I walked by. Um, the second time I saw him, he didn't see me. I was sort of behind him. Um, the strangest story I heard is that he's in this class, about statistics, a statistics class, and they were talking about um, like infant mortality rates or something having to do with children, and they were talking about the way that statistics can be shown to um, sway people in either one direction or another. Like if you use a pie chart, it'll make it'll emphasize this, or if you say a ratio, it'll emphasize this. And he started arguing about um, how people are so moved by the statistic one in five, and he never said one in five women are raped, but everyone sort of knew that that's what he was talking about. Um, and then got into a lively debate with the class about why one in five is or is not an important statistic. Um, supposedly the teacher doesn't know that it's him, so the teacher thought it was like a happy little class discussion, whereas everyone in the class was like, no, what are you talking about? One in five is a really big number. So that's the most interesting anecdote I can share. Thank you. Um, so I guess I've been really moved by how much you are doing for us and for um, me and people of the next generation, and I'm sitting here thinking, well, what can we do for you? And I don't know if this would be possible or an invasion, um, but have you thought about some sort of schedule of where you're going to be during these cold months and some sort of posting so that those of us who live near the Upper West Side or wherever want to come and participate in helping you carry your mattress or in some way or is that, would that interfere with no, that's, um, the performative nature of what you're 
what you're doing. So that's already happening. Um, there's a, a Barnard senior named Ali Ricard who started this website called Carrying the Weight Together where you can just contact her and she has my schedule um, and sometimes <laughs> groups of people will help me carry. It gets a little messy because um, sometimes my class will get canceled and then there are all these people waiting outside of my class and I'm not there. Um, or things like that, but it's been pretty cool so far because um, they, these people have been very helpful. So yeah, you should check it out, carrying the weight together. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Hi, Emma. Um, from what I observed of the people that have supported you, at least from my perspective, or at least what I have access to, is um, a lot of people see you as this heron that you talked about as this hero, and you, you have a shield around you, and you're the strong woman. I see you in websites like the top 10 strong woman of the year, all these things. And the other side is that people pity you, and, and, and they wanna hug you, and they wanna take care of you, and they wanna, just the human feeling of that, which I'm not saying is negative, it's very important. And I guess my question is how you deal um, with this idea of a heron, of a strong person that, you know, is so, sort of starting a movement or raising awareness that this person that is a human and suffer this and needs to be hugged. So I, the, the, the idea of the pity and the hero and the strength and the weakness coming together, um, which I, I know is, is a hard question, but if you could speak about that, and I, even thinking about the word survivor rather than victim. So just your idea of the hero versus the human. Yeah, um, I've actually, yeah, when I, when I talk to survivors, often one of the things I find, and of course it's, you can never say this is true for everyone, but true for a lot of people that I've talked to, um, they've gotten a lot of pity from people. They're like, you know, they say they've been raped and someone goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And then the more, the more pity, like it's important to have the pity, but after a while the pity starts to get sickening because then you start to feel sick yourself. You're like, oh, do I need to be pitied? Am I broken? And then you, or, yeah, there's a long phase of like the sadness and the feeling broken and like there's a reason everyone needs to be pitying you all the time. Um, and I found that when I talk to survivors, often people are, I'm like, do you want me to say, like I, I actually will say this, they'll be like, do you want me to say I'm sorry or are you sick of pity? And often they're like, I'm really tired of pity. I'm like, yeah, because I'm mad at that guy. And they're like, yeah, I'm mad at that guy too. And then we can, you know, turn the sadness into a feeling of anger or um, which is I think more constructive um, and um, so yeah I, I feel like I've gotten so many pounds of pity at this point that it's sort of like I don't know I, I don't want to feel broken anymore I'm tired of people being like oh you poor thing um, and I, I feel like I, I have my, my family for that, um, but, because <laughs> they can take care of me when I'm broken. But, um, <laughs> and then in terms of a hero, that is a completely different thing because it just confuses me. I'm just like, I mean, as I said earlier, when the, that was one example, but another, another woman came up to me and told me that she sees me as the Rosa Parks of my generation. And I just like, I don't know, I just see myself as a person making an art piece at Columbia and um, it just really, like it's, I don't think I'll ever look at myself in the mirror and go, hero, <laughs> you know? So I think, I think we have Liz creeping up on us. I would say Shiro. <laughs> Also, just as a reminder, Rosa Parks said, I didn't do this to start a movement. I was just damn tired. <laughs> That's pretty much how I would see it. <laughs> so thank you, Emma. Thank you, Roberta. And uh, this program, as all of our programs, can be seen on uh, www.brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA. And I'd like to say a holiday shout out to David and to Euro Pacific, who is our cameraman and who produces all of our videos that are online and available to you. And I want to thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. I'm glad you all 
came, and we're going to have an informal tea and coffee outside, thanks to Michael Pollack, who is uh, Brooklyn Roasting Company. So please, instead of coming up here to address questions, please move your way out onto the Beaux-Arts Court, have some tea and coffee, and have an opportunity if you would like to speak to Emma and Roberta. And I thank you. I wish you all a very happy, healthy <laughs> new year. A lot of strength, a lot of purpose, and keep on marching 2015. Thank you.